Now, let us discuss what follows, what must follow if we are to be saved, what pleases the Lord if we be those who confess the faith. As was said previously, without the confession of the faith, there is no possibility that your quote-unquote obedience to the commandments, love for God and neighbor, can be God-pleasing because the Lord Jesus Christ is himself the way, the truth, and the life. So if you have denied the truth by failing to confess the faith, then you have not love for God. And any obedience, no matter how strictly you obey the commandments or how much time you spend in prayer, cannot be ultimately salvific and God-pleasing. But let's say now that you are one who confesses the true faith in a God-pleasing manner. Then there are two, if you will, breaking it down into a poetic simplification, two aspects of your salvation, which we see in the lives of all the saints. We see the active life and the contemplative life. So sexual continence is necessary both for a God-pleasing active spiritual life and for the final union, divine eros, deification, which is salvation, as Saint Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain put it, without theosis there is no salvation. So we long for our salvation, which is to say we long to be united with Christ, who is in the Old Testament more than once depicted archetypically in female form so that the male votary, hopefully that's you, can use his sexual attraction, his capacity to be sexually attracted towards Christ. Now there's a wonderful story in the book of Genesis, a difficult story you might say, but wonderful for our purposes, which illustrates this process. Again, we're talking about someone who is a son of Abraham, which is to say, confessing the true faith. And that is Jacob became Israel in the Old Testament, one of the patriarchs. Son of Abraham, meaning preserver of the true faith, as all who preserve the true faith are sons and daughters of Abraham. And Jacob, towards the latter part of the book of Genesis, is said to approach a well where he sees Rachel this very beautiful young woman, and he desires her. This is what happens when, through the power of fantasy, you have knowledge that God reveals into your imagination. And the fathers tell us this is the right purpose of your imagination, so that you may have a concept of paradise before you're there. Before Christ is born within you, before you become God by grace, you must have using your power of imagination, a glimpse of what paradise is. And so Jacob meets this beautiful young woman, Rachel, at the well. And then he negotiates with her father, Laban, to marry her. And he must labor for seven years, and he does. And then on his wedding night, the father, Laban, switches into the bridal chamber his eldest daughter, Leah, who was not as beautiful, although virtuous, and we are told in the text that she had dim eyes. So what this means is, seven years is the labor of fullness. It is also the number of self-denial. So seven days in the week. It's also the number of asceticism. Of course, the ground floor of this is sexual continence, which is what we discuss very often here. And this is where it's absolutely necessary. If you would be united to Christ and divine eros, 
your sexual energy can't just be shooting out of your penis because that's not going to allow your God-given desiring faculty to unite you to Christ in erotic intimate union. It's not possible unless you're sexually continent. So being a sexually continent man, laboring towards your salvation, deny yourself for seven years, and then on your wedding night you have hope of becoming God by grace, entering into full divine eros with very God of very God. You have hope of having entered fully into this holy dance of David, which is to say that one becomes intimate with God the Holy Ghost, with God the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And this is, of course, only possible by the grace of God the Holy Ghost. And yet, then on his wedding night, he discovers, ah, he doesn't have Rachel in the bed. It's Leah, whose eyes were dim. That is to say, he had not yet the uncreated light. It was not yet divine eros. He labored and denied himself to be with Rachel. But then, instead of being given the contemplative life, that is the perfection of salvation, instead, he has acquired the virtues. And then Leah gives birth to seven children. Now, we know there are nine fruits of the Spirit from St. Paul. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, humility, and self-control. We know that together, love and humility are greater than all the rest of the virtues combined. One who has perfect love and humility is become God by grace. But... There are the other virtues, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. We left out love and humility. So this means Jacob has labored as a sexually continent man to acquire theosis, to enter in to intimate union with Jesus Christ, but he falls short. Instead, he's acquired joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. But he had not yet love and humility. And then finally, he is given Rachel, whose eyes were bright, of course. this The implication here is seeing the uncreated light. The fathers say, if you do not see Jesus Christ face to face in this lifetime, do not expect to see him in the next. In other words, theosis is salvation. If you don't have the uncreated light, without theosis, no one can be saved, says St. Nicodemus of Mount Athos. So then we learned that he was required to labor for another seven years, although he was given Rachel. She did not bear her two sons. Rachel had only two sons. until the bride price was paid. So there we see he finally acquires love and humility. This is all of the fruits of the Spirit. This is to love the Lord your God with all your very being and to love your neighbor as yourself. This is the fullness of the fruits of the Spirit. This is the fruit of the Spirit being evidence that in fact God the Holy Ghost dwells within you. You have entered into the kingdom of heaven you have re-entered paradise while still alive in the body, and so may enjoy that felicity eternally, provided that you persevere until the end, which means that you preserve the true faith. Which you then live out by your good works. So the life of the virtues, which is to say, the outward expressions of your obedience, such as your faithfulness in 
fasting prayer and almsgiving. It's focused on achieving Rachel. It's focused on divine union. And yet, though you hope for her, you find that the less beautiful one is given you first. So that's joy and peace and patience. As we said, the nine fruits of the Spirit, you get the seven but love and humility first. And then finally, that bride price being paid. You see, only after the bride price was paid, which was another seven years of Jacob's labor for Rachel, were the two sons born. But he had Rachel whose eyes were bright and beautiful, which is to say, this is the second spiritual phase of illumination. The first is purification, as manifest by the possession of the virtues, save love and humility. The second phase is illumination. This is the union with Rachel. And then the final realization, becoming God by grace, this is manifest as love and humility with all the other virtues. And so those are the three phases of Orthodox Christian spirituality corresponding in this order to the order of the ascetic, which is body, noose, and heart. Body, first degree, this is your physical obedience to the commandments, your sexual continence. Illumination, this is you've received Rachel. This is when continual prayer is given to one, where God the Holy Ghost is acting internally, continually. This is the importance of the Jesus prayer, especially Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. But it is not theosis until then the noetic energy finally descends into the heart. And God, the Holy Ghost, by grace, gives the baptism of the Holy Ghost. St. Gregory Palamas explains this in great detail, this process of salvation. St. John Cassian explains it as well. And St. Simeon, the new theologian especially, emphasizes that you are only baptized and chrismated that you may eventually receive the baptism of God, the Holy Ghost. This is Pentecost. So this is the road for the sexually continent man clings to the true faith who is himself a son of Abraham. You labor for that to which domination gives birth by grace, theosis, deification. Prior to that is illumination. This is the union with Rachel, which followed, of course, the marriage to Leah. And this is the path of the sexually continent man if he has the true faith. It leads to the acquisition of the active Christian life and then the contemplative. Progressing in the order of body, noose, and heart, which is the order of learning, the order of the ascetic, the order of instruction. And those three phases in Orthodox Christian spirituality are purification, illumination, and deification. We see this again in the New Testament. Traditionally, catechumens would have a catechumen of three years, but the fasting period before their baptism, which is now enshrined for all of us as Great Lent, would include very strict fasting for 40 days. Exorcisms prayed over them every day. In the ancient world, it was already well known to go 40 days with no food or water. So imagine this intense preparation. But then baptism is illumination. It's meant in reality. Baptism and chrismation is meant to confer illumination. And then Pentecost, there we are, this is theosis. And in the New Testament, the Gospels According to Saints Matthew, Mark, and Luke, were read as preparation for baptism. The Gospel of Saint John was only read after baptism. And then once theosis has been given as the baptism of God the Holy Spirit, the order of the apostle then begins at the heart. 
out of love. He is sent in the body, and this is joy. And then finally, following Christ, the ascension to heaven, this is peace. So the order of the ascetic is body, noose, heart. The order of the apostle then starts at the heart, where the ascetic has left off, and it is heart, body, noose, being the ascent into heaven, the eternal temple in which the Holy Trinity is constantly worshipped to the doxology, the doxology of the angels. And your life is meant right now. Because today is the day of salvation. It is meant to be doxological and Eucharistic now and for eternity. May God empower us by his grace to preserve the true faith, to labor ascetically and spiritually in prayer, fasting, and almsgiving according to the teaching of the church, that we might be saved, that we might be deified, that we might become God by grace and dwell in eternal felicity with Christ our bridegroom in the intimacy of that heavenly bridal chamber.